you know, while I may be still a ways off, <laughs> I'm glad that I'm finally learning what true worship is, you know, and with that knowledge comes a greater uh, recognition and, and a greater appreciation for worship. And I must say that along with the knowledge, along with the recognition, and along with the appreciation come less tolerance for what is not worship. <laughs> you know, without being judgmental or unfairly critical, there are some religious experiences that go against my grain that just really rub me the, long, the wrong way. And quite honestly, they are experiences that really don't strike me as being worship. It sometimes comes across as a purely entertainment or obvious performance that's all about us and not about God. Or may come across as nothing we've ever seen or heard before. I'm talking about some sometimes weird experiences. I mean, certainly we have different styles of worship and ways in which we worship God. Uh, but there are some basic fundamental characteristics of worship that we should be able to recognize and practice. There are many challenges to worship, not the least of which was the, uh, the big shutdown of the churches during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. But that's far from being the only contributing factor. The challenge of worship and the challenge to worship and the challenge of worshiping have been problems for the church and for the body of Christ since the birth of organized religion. I mean, we deal with challenges every day from within as well as from without. And the biggest challenges actually come from within each of us. Usually, you know, we're our own worst problem. There are challenges, and listen, that are, that are on a corporate scale, and then there are uh, societal challenges. But the most challenging and therefore the most damaging is uh, those challenges on a personal level. Uh, uh, that worship, uh, worship on a personal level that is being challenged. And again, you know, it's always that way. Our biggest problem is with self. Get on in here. You know what time it is. Come on now. Well, welcome to Tuesday in the Word on this Tuesday, April the 19th. Now, Sister Brenda's birthday. Happy birthday. I'm Isaac Whitehead, Jr., the senior pastor of First Baptist Church, Gainesville, Georgia. That's 1810 Martin Luther King, Jr. Boulevard, Gainesville, Georgia, 30501. May the blessing of the Lord be upon you as you join us for Bible study today. And, of course, it is our prayer that you join us every Tuesday. I pray your strength in the Lord. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. You know it. Yes, Facebook. Yes, YouTube. It's that time again. It's time to get this word, get in this word, to get the word in us, in our hearts, and in our minds. Have you been studying? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a worker that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing, correctly, accurately dividing the word of truth. Scripture says what? These, and I hope that includes you, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Study that word. The word works, and it will, my friend, work for you. That is, if you work it. Thank you for subscribing to our YouTube channel and for following us on Facebook. You know the drill. Like, subscribe, and share. Thank you very much. You know, I'll be one of the first to uh, admit that there is plenty of uh, what I call fat that we can cut from the order of worship. I mean, we still include some traditions and practices that are obsolete and just downright <laughs> boring. Uh, I mean, church can sink to um, becoming as exciting as watching grass grow or watching paint dry. I mean, it's not exactly what, what we call a moving experience. Have you been there? I have. Amen. Worship cannot be rushed. There are no shortcuts to worship. We can't 
we can't uh, shortchange worship. I mean, I know, I, I, I know because I've tried. <laughs> I've tried keeping it short. I've even planned to keep it short. I mean, I, uh, there are times I really wanted to cut across the field. I tried to rush through it, you know, perhaps because I, I was like many of you. I had other things to do, I thought. <laughs> and sometimes we even think we have more important things to do. Not. There's nothing, nothing more important for us to do than to worship and praise our God. Are you hearing me? I mean, I've tried to say only what I wanted to say and do only what I wanted to do. But I was denied. <laughs> I was overruled by the Holy Spirit of God. Listen, my friend, true worship, authentic worship is a bit different than what we think of as worship. I found myself trying to control worship only to discover that there's no such thing as me controlling worship. Only the Spirit, Spirit of God, controls worship. Worship is never in our hands. Worship is in the hands of God. And our best move is to get on board with God, ride it as far and as long as we can. Are you hearing me? I mean, if we're having just an event, maybe we can control that. If we're just having a gathering of people, perhaps we can, uh, you know, maybe we can control that. But true worship we, my friend, we cannot control. Listen to me today. As a matter of fact, true worship controls us. Yes, that's what it is. When we begin to worship God, when we begin to lift up praise and adoration to God, then the Spirit of God moves us. There's no way that we can't control worship, but I'm glad today that God, listen, by His Holy Spirit, He controls us. Amen? That's, when I'm, that's why when I, when I shout the way that I do, I can't help it. I'm being controlled by the Holy Spirit. When I jump, when I roll, whatever I may do, if I just sit there and fold my hands and listen to the Word of God, amen, I'm still being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. You know, you know what y'all say all the time, uh, let go and let God. Then why don't you let it go then? And why don't you let God? Let go and unleash and release the spirit of worship into the atmosphere. You know, a church can have a pattern of worship, a standard for worship, and yet someone in that place, someone in that building, someone in that place of worship can violate that worship experience and can absolutely kill the spirit of worship. So it's not always the church's fault. It's not always uh, the leader's fault. I mean, sometimes people can sort of get into themselves uh, and sometimes they can let the devil get in them and ruin the whole spirit of worship. Are you hearing me, my friend? Because I know that at First Baptist Church we have an established standard. We have an established pattern of worship. And that's just really uh, where we allow God to lead us and guide us as we maintain the order in the church. Are you hearing me? Scripture does tell us, let all things be done decently and in order. But sometimes people can get outside of those boundaries and mess worship up. Amen. And we have to correct that. Are you hearing me today? Because listen, my friend, worship, listen, there are people that are in the place of worship that can violate that standard, that can really ruin your worship experience. I mean, I'm talking about kill the spirit of worship. And I mean, uh, you know, we have to admit, admittedly, we don't do a lot of teaching about worship. We don't do a lot of telling people uh, what the Lord expects from us uh, in, in, in terms of worship. So many of us just simply shoot from the hill. And then we end up doing what we want to do rather than what he wants us to do. Please hear me today. Worship is much more than simply screaming, shouting, or waving our hands. Worship is more than that. That yeah, remind me, <laughs> a few weeks ago, uh, uh, Cynthia and uh, Peyton, MJ, were in church, and, and uh, Peyton was talking to me after church and telling me about church, uh, and, and she was able to tell me about the sermon. But she was just uh, uh, beside herself. You know that Cynthia's in the United Methodist Church, and I won't go there, but Peyton acted like she had never seen uh, 
uh, how could I say, uh, animated worship. <laughs> she had like she never seen animated. Maybe she had never seen Papa animated like that. But she says, uh, she's a Papa. I saw you up there, and you you were just up there, just waving your hands and hollering, and up there just waving your hands. <laughs> and, you know, I was glad she was at least paying attention to something. And I did, you know, I pushed it, I asked her, I said, well, what did you remember about the sermon? And she was able to tell me what she remembered about the sermon. Uh, but anyway, you know, I may be shouting, and I, I may be waving my hands, but trust me, my friend, there is some rhyme and reason for it. I'm not just screaming for my health, and I'm not just hollering and be hollering. I'm not just raising my hand and waving my hands. It is a... Uh, it is an eruption of an internal experience that I'm having with God. It is a spiritual combustion in my heart, in my soul, where I said, I wouldn't say anything. I wasn't going to tell it. But it was like fire shut up in my bones. Are you hearing me today? Ignorance of worship and confusion about worship is no excuse for not worshiping. Yes, we should be taught about worship. But it is our personal responsibility to seek, to know, and uh, listen, gain the knowledge and, and understand uh, the practice of worship. That's where we're going today. John chapter 4, Gospel of John chapter 4, beginning with verse 19. We're going to look at verses 19 through 24. John chapter 4 and uh, verses 19 through 24. And as usual, uh, we're in the King James uh, Version of the Scripture. Now, because I want us to understand worship. We, we're not going to go into great detail today. Uh, but I just want to, the main thing I really want to do, I think the main purpose today is to uh, call us back to worship. Amen. To uh, raise our awareness uh, of worship and the importance of worship, my friend. And that we be about worshiping our God. Get back in the church. Are you hearing me? Get back in the mode and the mood, if you will, of worship. Get our minds stayed on the Lord. Amen. So John chapter 4, John chapter 4, and we're going to begin with verse number uh, 19. I think I'm going to need a little help this morning, so let's get this help here. It says, the woman said unto him, that the woman said to Jesus, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Uh, I sense and uh, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men are to worship. Hear the word of God, my friend. Then verse 21 says, Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, the hour cometh, when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Verse 22, you worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Salvation came through the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. Amen? Amen. Verse 23, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers, the true worshipers, it says, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Let me pause right there for a moment, my friend, because Jesus is telling us, I want you to understand something. The place of worship is important. Are you hearing me? The building, it is important. But Jesus wants us not to uh, worship the building, respect the building, honor the building, and, uh, but Jesus wants us to, to uh, be focused on worshiping God. Amen. It is from us to God. He says, uh, 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 he, he says now, uh, there's going to come a time, you may not worship here in the mountain, you may not worship in, in Jerusalem, but the hour cometh, and he really said, it is now, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Are you hearing me, my friend? He says, but the hour cometh, now is, when the true worshiper, when the true uh, worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He, listen to what he said. He says, for the Father, seeking such to worship him. Amen. Listen, my friend, if we're going to do something for God, let's do it his way. I said, if we're going to do something for the Lord, let's do it his way. If you want God to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, then it has to be done his way. 
Amen. Then it goes on, verse number 24, it says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him, what? Must worship him in spirit and in truth. Are you hearing me, my friend? This woman, this woman was seeking the proper way, the proper place in which to, for her to worship God. She did not want to miss it, and she did not want to get it wrong. Are you hearing me? She uh, took the initiative. She showed the interest in wanting to know, how shall I worship the Lord? Where shall I worship the Lord? When shall I worship the Lord? Amen. You know, not only does worship become challenging, my friend, listen, just sometimes getting to worship can be a challenge. Getting our minds right for worship can be challenging. I mean, enjoying the experience of worship can sometimes be challenging. You know, aside from our uh, ignorance of worship, look at what we have to go through to get to worship and to really get in the mindset of worship. It's work. You know, the government ordered the churches to shut down, but let's be honest about it. Many of us really weren't all that churchy in the first place. Yeah, for some... During the pandemic, they fell off the wagon of worship and have not yet regained their desire for church or for worship. Yes, we've suffered some major setbacks, my friend. We have to endure the stress and strain of work all week. We have to deal with the people we'd rather not see or encounter. We may be broke, busted, and disgusted. And certainly that could and that does affect our worship sometimes. And what about when worship becomes a drag, a chore? It becomes a thing sometimes of the past and it has for many today. Then, my friend, we have to deal with those who aren't comfortable with church and therefore they aren't comfortable in church. You already heard that. You saw my quote. Yes. You know, so why is it that some are not comfortable with church? Well, maybe it, it's a trust issue. Maybe uh, they just don't know what church is all about. Maybe they don't know what worship is all about. Maybe they don't understand the importance of worship. And, uh, you know, maybe they be a little bit leery of us because we act a little strange sometimes. You know, it may be the multitude of personalities that work in the church. Or maybe the less than desirable attitudes and actions of a few within the congregation. Please hear me, my friend. As leaders and experienced saints in the church, we have to help people understand that worship is more than the babbling of religious jargon. Worship is, is an expression of love and adoration for the Lord. We have to, uh, uh, we, we not only, uh, you, you know the song that uh, Sister Gladman often sings sometimes, uh, uh, we have a right to praise the Lord. Well, listen, my friend, we not only have a right to praise Him, thank you, Sister Gladman, we have an obligation to praise and worship our God. It's an obligation. Wor worship is more than a religious ritual. You heard my quote, you've seen it. It's more than a religious ritual. Are you hearing me, my friend? Listen, it's more than just going through the motion. It's a personal and a public experience with God. Well, we as a family of God join in worship together. It is a, a witness to the love and to the power of God. Please hear me, my friend. Along with the pandemic, there were and there are. There are other factors. There were other factors that led us to trade religion for recreation and to trade church for the comfort of our homes. Far too many, far too many. The closing of the churches, just as the closing of the schools brought joy and jubilation. The closing of the church, the closing of our schools even. For many, it brought joy and jubilation. And I'm not just talking about children who didn't want to go to school. I'm talking about adults who didn't want to go to church. Are you hearing me, my friend? Listen, and even some, for some, there was this sigh of relief. Oh, I don't have to do that anymore. Oh, I don't have to go anymore. Some acted as though they had been <laughs> released from a religious prison. And maybe some of you felt that. And maybe that's part of our fault as leaders of the church. You know, when the pandemic kept us from church, when sickness and illness and death kept us from church, from the worship experience, when the psychological stress and strain 
of separation and isolation kept us from church. When the collapse of our finances and with the disruptions in our relationships, there was a time when we should have been drawn closer to the Lord, but instead we drifted further from the Lord. Are you hearing me, my friend? As all of this has taken place, we did not mourn for the church. We did not weep for the church. We, and listen, and we did not long for the worship. For many of us, we did not seek the Lord and we did not cry out to him to reopen the place of worship and restore the spirit of worship and restore the practice of worship. We were deterred, we were distracted, and we were in many ways denied the basic rights of religious freedom. Please hear me, my friend. Maybe you don't understand what has happened to the church, what has happened to us as saints of God. We were discouraged by all the political nonsense, preoccupied by all the racial and financial challenges that we were facing and that many of us are still facing. We lost interest in worship. We lost our appetite for church and for worship. And now we have resigned ourselves to seeking satisfaction elsewhere. As the righteous brothers would say, we've lost that loving feeling. It's time, my friend, to rebuild the church of God. It's time to restore worship, not just in the church, not just in our places of worship, but mainly it's time to restore it in our hearts and in our minds. Please hear me, my friend. It's the time, listen, it's time to spark a dead situation. It's time to reignite the fire. It's time to fan the flames. And it's time to call on the Holy Spirit to spiritually set things afire in our hearts and in our churches. Hear me, my friend. The house of God was never meant to function without people, without worship. The house of God was never meant to become a museum where everybody's on display. The house of God was never meant to become a mausoleum where the dead dwelled. The house of God and the experience of worship were never meant to be a boring place or a mundane experience. Let me tell you something, my friend. The house of God is what I will call today. And I want you to remember this. The house of God. Yes, it's the house of prayer. Yes. It is church. Yes. It is our place of worship. Yes. But here's what I want to call it today. The house of God is the fireplace. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that didn't excite you? It does me. The house of God is the fireplace, the place of spiritual fire. <laughs> yes, hallelujah. I see you, I see you. Pastors, I see you, I hear you. Churches, I see you, I hear you. I know, listen, that, that many of us have turned away from church and hadn't looked back that we going on about our business, but, but I see you. There's so many of you who are coming back who are back. And, uh, and, you know, it's kind of like looking over the horizon or just looking over uh, over the top of the buildings, over in the, in, in the next community, maybe in the next city, even in the next state, and, and, and afar off. It's kind of like seeing a smoke signal, you know. Uh, you, you, you see something in the atmosphere. Yeah, I'm getting excited already. The fireplace. You see something in the atmosphere. There's a, there's a, let's call it a smoke signal. There's a, there's a smoke signal over there that uh, uh, tells us, that alerts us that uh, something is going on over there. Yeah, that something is going on over there. And, and every now and then, I love it. I can, I can look out over Gainesville, you know. I can, I can look out over our community. I can look out from my church and, and I, I see something in the atmosphere over there. And I see something going on over there at GLM, Pastor Hutt. Yeah, I, I see something in the atmosphere. There's something rising over there. Something is going on over there. Yeah, when I look over towards even St. John, even Antioch, even Mount Calvary, when I look over there, I'm looking over there in the neighborhood. I'm looking out over the horizon and, and there's some signals rising or something. It's going on over there. 
Amen. Even when I look all the way out to New Life and Timber Ridge, have you ever looked at that? And you see something rising out there. Uh, that tells me that, that something is going on over there. There's a, there's a spiritual fire somewhere. Hallelujah be to God. When I, when I just look a, a few blocks over there to, to St. Paul, and, and uh, I see something happening over there. Yeah, And sometimes, you, you remember the song says, Hush. Hush. Yeah. Somebody's calling my name. Yeah. Uh, hush. I can, hear, uh, I can hear the singing, and I can hear the praise, and I can hear the worship. Hallelujah be to God. And, and I'm glad about it. Thank you. Thank you for uh, restoring the worship. Thank you. And, uh, and I know it's a challenge. It's still a challenge. It's challenging to get the people back in church. And can I tell you a secret? Please, don't tell anybody. Most of all, don't tell any preachers this. It's a challenge to get the preachers back in church. Amen. Amen. Now, that's just between you and me. Now, don't tell anybody that. But I thank God, amen, that, that many of you are back. And I, I see you. I hear you. I'm looking over there in your area. There's something going on over there. I can see it. I can even feel it. It's like a, a, a what do you call it, level eight or whatever uh, a magnitude of, a, of an earthquake. Something is happening. Something, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. Amen. And even though... It is a challenge, my friend. It's a challenge, maybe for us to get to church. It's a challenge for us to get our minds right. It's a challenge. We're dealing with so much. It's a challenge to encourage the people to get back in church, to encourage the young people to come back to church, to encourage lifelong members of the church who have drifted away and have not looked back, who have gotten off into something else. I know worship can be a challenge. I know church can be a challenge. I know people can be a challenge. But don't let that discourage you or deter you from church nor from worship, my friend. Amen. I'm happy to see that, uh, uh, that so many of you are re-engaging. Yeah, I I'm glad to see that. There are many churches and pastors that are reopening the church and restoring worship. And here's what I want to leave you with, my friend. I say that since we have a church, since we have a church, since we have a church at First Baptist and St. John and Antioch and uh, Calvary and uh, uh, Timber Ridge and New Life and you know all the many churches, St. Paul and all the many churches, New Salem, all the many churches, St. Paul, First Baptist, all the many churches. Since we have a church, then let's have church. Get out of here. Enjoy your week. Love you with the love of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for restoring worship in our hearts and worship in our spirits. Oh God, continue to work in us, through us, Lord God, and with us that we might do those things that are pleasing in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. God bless you, my friend. And I pray that you have a blessed and a safe week. Talk to you soon.